have joy with God because of his love and his mercy and his grace and his blessings and his favor and his presence. He's given us all things, everyone. You're not lacking, you're not lacking anything. Whatever your need is, if you're depressed, if you're depressed, and we've shared that with you, anxiety in the heart causes depression, the word says. But just a finish there, it says, but a good word makes it glad. What's that good word? You and I, open your mouth, speak God's word out, especially God's word, because that brings life into a situation. Declare it over your life, over your family, over whatever you're doing in the name of Jesus. I'm not preaching. <laughs> Come on, Come on, Come on, Come on uh, But anyway, I'll give you a warm welcome. And wonderful to see our students with us today. And uh, good to see you alone. So welcome everyone. If you want to con connect with them and say let's go and have a cup of tea or coffee or yeah. Yeah, listen to their stories, they're here, they've got so much enthusiasm and whatever they're studying. Oh young people, welcome and I hope that you feel loved and valued in the house today. And our lovely lads here. I just think they're lovely. I'm just they're just said they're very quiet, but that's because they don't know us yet. <laughs> but when we draw it out, then anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, we're here. We, we meet 10, 10 o'clock in every Sunday morning for prayer, a cup of tea, and fellowship. And listen, why is it important? In the midst of our prayer meeting, the phone went with an emergency from a member of our church. So you don't know what the day brings, but it's so important, yeah. listen, to lift each other up. I said it on the church app this morning. See you at church. Let's encourage one another yes. and worship yeah. God. Amen? Yeah. And then also our, we have our communion service this morning. And then um, our life group is on Monday nights yes. by Zoom. So most everybody knows about that. So see Mickey, Christine, I don't know who else, and yeah. Ken. On the, if you want to join that, students especially, and Wednesday night by Zoom is our prayer meeting. Yeah. Come, because we, 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 we talk to God. We actually do, and we listen to him, and we encourage because, you know, if you didn't, you just see each other on a Sunday. Mm. Now, we do have a church app, a church group, that is daily yeah, bombarded. With, and the that. purpose of it is to encourage and have prayer. So we're not doing that to condemn anyone, to bring anyone down. That's, we won't have that. Amen. It's about building up Amen. the body of Christ. If you would like to join that, see me, I'm the admin, and I can add you. And then if you have a prayer need in the week, you might be studying, you might have an exam, you don't know, then say, will you pray for me? I need this. Of course we will, and I can guarantee you the church will pray. Amen. Christine runs, um, she runs a community outreach called New Beginnings. And they're having, do you want to say it, Christine? Do you, do you want to come and tell them? Because is it um, and where you meet? Yeah. Good morning, saints of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. Jesus. So New Beginnings, it came out of, uh, it's out of our church. And uh, the Lord said to plant where you are, which she did, that God uh, told Bill and Denise. And so it's a community group where it's it's everything. We do food provision and uh, we support people who need things for clothes, anything. Anyway, um, since last month, the beginnings now, we're able to, um, if you need any emergency food, we're able to give you a voucher, and then you can go to um, it's usually gateways and just pick up some food for your family or yourself. So just come see me or do or something. Yeah. Okay. I don't like talking. Just in less than a minute. <laughs> So, Lord, we thank you that, Lord, your word is life to life and health to all his flesh. 
And not only them, Lord, if there's any emergencies here and families and friends that people are believing for, we send forth your healing word right now where they're at, in their bed, as they're walking, as they're sitting, and we release your healing word, oh God, over them, your healing power. And I thank you, Father God, that you watch over your word to perform it. It will not return to you void. It will accomplish what it's sent out to do, and that's to heal, and we give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How many love Aunt Taylor here? Yeah. You know, you know, I always say, Anthony and Rhea, they come, Amen. you know, every Sunday, they just come in, they, they don't have to give them a list of uh, instructions, they do what, they know what to do, and the ushers, and uh, Anthony gets down there, his daughter's usually with him, and the, you know, every Sunday before you come, the alarm system is checked, and uh, we, we go through that, and make sure communion is out if needed, mm-hmm. and straighten up the place there. and they do all those things quietly so much so most you don't even know who's done it Amen. but that you know i thank god for faithful Amen. people yeah. so at the moment, i'll just read the word of god and we're going to pray and take communion and take it right where you're at and uh during communion if you want to give a prayer of thanksgiving then uh, a brief one then do so we're going to take our reading as usual from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. And the word of the Lord says this, But I received from the Lord that which I also <coughs> delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup. After supper saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. 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 Harlan, you can serve. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Feel free if you want to give a prayer of thanksgiving. Remember that the disciples on their road to Damascus and people began to, you know, they recognized that they'd been with Jesus as they came back. And as the disciples in Jerusalem, they began to say, we perceive these have been with Jesus. And I, that night I went in church, I didn't re- recognize it in that way, but I knew these people were different. I knew they had something different to what I'm used to. And it, you guess what? It was something magnetic. It drew me to it. I wanted it. I wanted it. And I learned it was all because of Calvary. All because Jesus gave his life a ransom for each and every one of us. The Bible says he can bond us back with his precious blood. Amen. The devil stole our souls, but Jesus came and bought us back. Don't you thank God for that? Amen. I do. You can clap. Come on. We see, we see the terrible effects around the world today. 
But guess what? We've still got joy in the Lord. Amen. Still got joy. Because we know where we're going. We know where we're going. Hallelujah. These last few weeks, this is the last one of our series, and the I Am's of Christ. And we, we learned in, in week one of our sermons that He, Christ, said, I am the bread of life. We learned that that was the divine name, I am Ego Iman. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not even an English scholar, but you know. I learned that it's the divine name of God. And Jesus began in our series, he began telling us that he said, I am the bread of life. And it's a staple of everyday life, isn't it, for most people, is bread. I mean, the bread they give us nowadays is not very good for us. I have to try and avoid white bread. In fact, I try and avoid bread at all, but your slice of toast. But here's the true bread. That's the sustenance that we need for everyday life. Then the second thing we looked at, Christ said, I am the light of the world. Amen. And he's got the answers we learned. He said also number three, that he said, I am the door of the sheep. And we learned about the shepherd blocking the door of the of the fold and uh, you know anything that got in. Couldn't get in at night through the door because the shepherd was across the doorway. And he said that others come and they have to get over the fence illegally. And he's our protector, amen. He's our shepherd. And that went on to say week four that he is the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. And that spoke to us about his protection and his caring for the sheep. And he had to chase off the wolves. He said, that come dress in sheep's clothing. That's how subtle the devil is, isn't it? How many you know, if the devil come along, just for instance, the way the world portrayed the devil, with arms and a, 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 a tail and a fork, you know. We wouldn't fall for it, would we? No. But he comes dressed up. He comes dressed up as a friend. Even a, a religious person. But Jesus said he begins to recognise the wolves dressed in sheep clothing. And he, he brings that love and protection for us. And then we looked at Jesus being the resurrection and the life. We just briefly spoke about being... Uh, the, the crucifixion and the communion and Jesus said I am the life I am the resurrection and the life and that gives us that assurance we shouldn't have to worry about our life he said don't worry about what you eat and what you should wear be like the lilies of the valley and just you know trust in God that doesn't mean you don't do anything with them we still have to work we still have to produce but ultimately Christ is our supply He's our life. Then last week, we looked at Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And we learned last week that Christ is exclusive. Amen. There's not many roads to God. And, and, and sad, and it's a shameful, but sad. I've heard Christians say there's many roads to God. Someone said to him, Oh, we're all the main faiths are from the, uh, the forefathers of the Jews, Abraham, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. And I think it's such a lie. Because Jesus said there's no other way. It might sound good, it might be, oh, I love everybody, but Jesus exclusively said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through Christ. A lot of people don't like that, especially in the world today. You can preach on anything, you can talk about anything, but you talk about the name of Jesus, you want to get a reaction from devils. People don't know they've got demons. You see, I think, what I learned early on in the Christian life is, we think, to have a devil you've got to be possessed, no, 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 no. 
you can have a demonic attachment to your life. It can bring sickness, it can bring poverty, it can bring disruption, it can bring anger, it can bring anything. When Jesus was walking along the beach one day with Peter, and he, and, and he said, you know what, I've got to go soon and they're going to crucify him. Not so, Lord, Peter said. And Jesus looked beyond him and said, get thee behind me, Peter. No, he didn't. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Satan was the one that was influencing what he was saying. And so we have to be careful. We're allowing to influence us. Today I want to finish off this series with uh, Jesus saying that he's the true vine. So John 15 verses 1 through 5. If you've got your Bibles with you. And I do like this. I do like bringing your Bible because it shows that we're attentive. If you've got it on your phone, that's okay. Write it down. A good student will take notes. Because the flesh will deceive us. Oh God, really spoke to me there. I shan't forget that. I woke up in the night many a time and God spoke to me so clearly. But when I woke up next morning, I couldn't remember what it was. Okay, John chapter 15, verse 1 through to 5. Jesus said, I am the true vine. There's that divine title again. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser or some of your Bibles say husbandman or gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And then he says abide in me. And now he knew. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. And without me, without Jesus, you can do nothing. So as we come to the last I am statement in John's Gospel, along with our previous week, statement, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now just to give you a, a, a quick picture, the disciples here and Jesus are making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And very shortly, Jesus will be arrested and then he's going to be taken to stand before the high priest and the Sanhedrin. And along this walk that they were doing, although camp is 100% certain, most scholars, it said, think Jesus and the disciples likely passed the vineyard as they made their way to Gethsemane. And Jesus, being who he was, saw another moment to teach the disciples an eternal lesson. And Jesus came along and he used the vineyard as an object lesson. You can imagine them stopping again, uh, uh, alongside this probably well kept vineyard, full of promise. For the coming harvest. Well, we've all learned about seed time and harvest, sowing seed, and as we sow seed, it's with a hope of the harvest. That's why, as we're giving our offering, we're sowing a seed into the kingdom of God with the hope of a harvest. It's going to reach souls, it's going to keep this ministry going so that we can reach out. And this is when he spoke these words. And here we are over 2,000 years on. 2,000 years removed from the words of Jesus. <coughs> and yet it remains as powerful today as it was when he spoken. There's an eternal truth, folks, today that you and I are going to have to consider and embrace in our lives. 
as we consider these words. The first one is I want us to discuss. Is Jesus said, I'm the true vine. And the very implication of that is that there's other vines that are not true, not the real thing. And so it's important this morning that we get the authenticity of the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, I'm the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser or the gardener or the husband. Jesus clearly tells us that vine's true character. He said, I am the vine. He is the Christ. And don't forget, they were in the epicenter of the religious world at their time. Jesus declared to the disciples as others, uh, that others will approach. Remember we said last week, all who came before Christ were fake. were not the real deal. They climbed over the sheepfold. They led the sheep astray. And Jesus taught us that he was the true shepherd. You see, as we touched on last week and I've mentioned today, the world outside the kingdom of God, but that you and I believe that all religions are the same. That we all serve the same God. They try to fool us to think it's just a cultural thing, but we all serve the same God. We're all going to the same heaven. We're just heading down different paths in life. And I heard a few things during the week as I was looking this up, especially from celebrities. One said, I'm brought up in the church. But since he got famous, he's learned that Christ is the only way. But there's many ways to Christ, to the Father. Oh, what a subtle lie. We know that they're not all leading to the Father. So don't fall for that line. The enemy comes in. He's so subtle. It might be a, a popular philosophy, but it certainly won't be consistent with the teachings of Jesus on biblical doctrine. Jesus didn't just say he's the way the true vine. He said, I am the true vine. What does that mean? We learned the other week that he alone is exclusive. He alone is the only way of salvation. And we know we find it difficult because we'll be confronted by anger and things. But when we say these things in the world, we have to be prepared to make his stand. Because you will be challenged. And then demons out there, friend, they manifest in anger, they manifest in um, whatever's going at the moment, the walk and all that stuff. What most people say who are influenced by demons, oh, you're telling me that I don't have a choice. See, they've made choice their religion. They've made choice their God. That's why people can have abortions and say, my body, my choice. Mm. It might be your body, your choice, but it's, the baby's not your body, your choice. And you want to see the manifestation of the demonic influence around you. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And if you and I, folks, this morning are to become acceptable to the Father, having that assurance of eternal life, we must abide in the true vine. It talks about the vine dresser. 
who's the vice caretaker, we can say. Jesus said, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. And he's the one who Jesus gives a picture that Jesus, the father is the, the gardener, the one that looks after the vineyard. And the Bible tells us that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, as the true vine. What for? To secure salvation for the entire vineyard. Not the grapes, but the vineyard is you and I in the world. And he says the vine dresser, the father, watched over and cares for the well-being of the vineyard. God has got his eye on us. God is looking after us. I remember one day, many years ago, I think it was 1985, and myself and Denise had packed up our bags with our children. We moved to Birmingham to Pioneer the Church. Didn't know it. For, I'd never been there before. I've been past it, but never in it. And we went there in faith, and the church sent us out, and you know, from, from Manchester, Salford, and we went down to Birmingham, not knowing where we were going. I forgot what I was telling you. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, the father being the vine dresser and looking after us. And, and anyway, so, this one day, we, we used to have a little uh, minibus, old Ford Transit, 12 seater, the pastor boss from the scrapyard. We used to bring people up from Birmingham to Manchester for the conferences and. Uh, it, it was hilarious because we used to come up the M6 in the rain and hail, and they could, you know, they could see the road from where they were sat. <laughs> the rain used to come up, and all the feet were wet by the time we got there. Oh, it was so funny. But anyway, this we used to use this minibus. We got a little um, PA system from Holland, which could click onto your battery. So we used to pull into an area of, of the uh, area where we were whatever part of the estate it was, <coughs> lift up the bonnet, click on the battery and preach away. And the devil didn't like this and so one day we, we had a team come from Manchester to help us. We we're all going, we went to this, area, this big estate, big council estate, and what we used to do was go to a particular corner and just preach the gospel, get the PA system out, click it on, preach the gospel, uh, leaflet the area, talk to people, then move on to another area. And the reason we did that, it was very crafty, because we didn't want to give the people a chance to phone the police and the police to come get. So by the time they'd done that, we'd moved to another place. And we'd gone all around the estate. Anyway, this was happening and we had the team, we're doing it. And anyway, we're coming along, I'm driving the minibus, I'm coming along, and uh, there was a parked car here as I was coming, there was parked car there, traffic coming out. So anyway, this car coming this way, I flashed me to come through because we both had an obstacle in our way. So I come round this car, as I come round, this vehicle came from behind them at such high speed and it was head on for the minibus. And somehow I swerved to the left, no, I swerved to the right, sorry, to get out because it already crossed onto my side of the road and it was going to be ahead. And I remember swerving and they were that close to us, we missed us by a hair, hair's breadth that. The pastor that was sat next to me said, If it's us, if it's us! And I pulled up. And what had happened, it was so sad. They missed us by a hair's breadth. And just as they did it, there was a bus stop, bus shelter, with people at it. And they skid along the bus shelter, concrete bus shelter. And at that very moment, a young man, gas, gas worker, you know, the British gas. I was coming out of this house with his with his toolbox to get in his van. And they boom and they crushed him and cut his leg off. That, you know, and I've never seen a manifestation of evil like this. And the, these lads got out and it was that high on drinking drugs. They were shouting at the man who'd been here for getting in their way. And we had to get out and, and separate and wait. 
you know, it took the police, I'm telling you the truth, it took the police nearly 50 minutes and the ambulance to get there. I thought the man was going to die and I was praying with him. But why would I tell you that story? It's because the devil was mad that we were preaching the gospel and he tried to cause chaos to stop us. <clears throat> And I remember, this is how God does it. So anyway, they took, his, they took our name and address, the police, when they come in. Later that evening, a police officer came to the house. And he was a backslider. And he said, you know what, I used to go to church, but when I see things like this, my faith in God is, 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 is shattered. How can you say that? I said, listen, that wasn't God. God didn't do that. God didn't chop his leg off. God didn't try to, to, to kill us. It was the devil. Anyway, we witnessed to him. That was it. The, the man ended up losing his leg. And it ended up, he said, you know what? He was doing a good deed. It was the house he was coming out of. It was a pensioner whose gas fire wasn't working. Now the goodness of his heart on his day off, he went to fix it and I'm coming out. And I said, you like ever, I'm gonna preach even more. Yeah. Went on more cars of this day. Not some more doors. <coughs> Jesus is the true value, he's not a fraud. The world makes us think, Whatever you do, that's okay. As long as you're happy. Remember that slogan that night it, just do it. You know, that's an act of rebellion. See, the Father comes on, Jesus comes, he said, the Father is the vine trust, he's the one that's going to take care of our lives. And I believe that day was divine protection. Father watches over the dinner, your life, my life. He's watching over us, isn't that comforting for him? <clears throat> Remember in 1989, I told you this story, when myself and a few pastors went, met some American pastors and we all went to uh, Moscow. This is before the Iron Curtain came down, 1989. I think it came down in 1992. 91, something like that, the Soviet Union, Union collapsed. But we went there, full of faith and boldness. And we was on the streets of Moscow and, and uh, Kiev. I hate to see it now, how it's being bombed to smithereens. But we were there on the streets preaching the gospel with boldness. And honestly, God, you know what? If we get arrested, we get arrested. It's in God's hands. Because we have that assurance that he was looking after us. I'm glad to tell you that we didn't get arrested. What we was going to do. But I foresee myself for a quick moment going to the salt mines in Siberia. Because that's where they sent you. You know, you get arrested in them places and it doesn't matter, you know, you might just be taking photographs and say you're a spy. And I got approached with a video camera on my shoulder doing all this. Oh, I'm, I'm a gunner. Well, the Father was looking after us. And Jesus begins to say that the Father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. And he said, Jesus, gonna, Father's going to come along and take away those branches that don't bear fruit. That's a scary thought, isn't it? When you read this properly, Think about it, meditate. He's going to take away the branches that don't bear fruit. Now, if you, if you read into it, it's not talking about the Father taking away the whole branch. It gives more of an understanding of pruning. Because the root word here is lifting up or, or uh, raising it up the branch off the ground. Because if you know anything about gardening and, and, and plantation, if the, you know, we used to have the, a 
small, a miniature um, weeping willow tree in our front garden. And it used to, you know, it was only about this high, but it used to grow downwards. But those parts that touched the ground rotted. And it was mainly Denise used to go with the clippers and trim them up, give it a, a, a shot back inside to lift it up. And that's what this means when he, 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 he takes away. He's talking about pruning. As a gardener comes and lifts that away, that's going to be affected. What does he do? He might look, oh, he's cutting out, you know, but he's lifting it up from harm's way. Why, does, why do we prune? Does anyone know why we prune? It's to produce more fruit. It's to promote fruit production. He lifts us up out the mud. I thank God he lifts our feet out the mighty clay. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that he puts us on solid ground. Yeah. I thank God this morning that he took control of my life. That I surrendered to him. And so as we said, this taking away is literally a pruning. How many know God prunes our life? You ever felt that pruning? How does he prune our life? Sometimes God takes away. And it doesn't have to necessarily be bad stuff in our life. It just can be stuff that's hindering production. And, and God has to come in as the vine dresser, as the husband man, and he has to take that away now. Some things I have to take away. I've learned as a pastor, I thank God people come in. But sometimes I thank God when they go. Not you. Not you. The troublemakers. Don't look so shout. Been around church a long enough, you'll find the troublemakers. You learn the other week that the wolves come in sheep clothing. I remember one girl got so upset with me one time in a, a different church. We used to have seven o'clock prayer meetings every morning, Monday to Friday. And I lived in Bolton and I was only looking after this church and I came down. I used to get up at 5 a.m. to leave at 6 a.m. to get to the church for 7 a.m. to get it warm for everyone. And quite a few used to come before work. And it had, the building was such a way that there was no rooms downstairs apart from the sanctuary. And we had an office built in the corner. So I got there early and being a coffee addict, the first thing I did was put, put the coffee pot on in the office. Not being, I wasn't aware that it was bothering anyone. But this girl who, who pretended to be so spiritual got up a, a couple of the people in the prayer meeting demanding that I stop this coffee because it's the smell of it is stopping them praying. <laughs> and it's annoying. I said, if it, would you like me to make you a cup of coffee? Is that bothering you? Or would I give you the keys so you can come and open? I can come a bit later. But the, but the, the strategy of the devil was to, to disrupt the prayer meeting, to stop the brothers and sisters praying, and their mind was on a coffee pot. And I did stop making the coffee. Because I thought, not because it bothered her, but because she bothered them. Right. See, I know I'll tell you later on that that girl was removed from the ministry through situations. And I've learned God takes people away from us sometimes, takes us away from them. Not because he's mad at us, not because he's punishing us, but because he wants to allow fruit to grow in our lives. Jesus. And sometimes, oh, where's brother so and so, where's sister so and so? Do you know? Well, sometimes God removes them. Maybe he wants the fruit to grow in their life that they're not producing in your presence, and vice versa. Because the word says there in verse, uh, verse 2 of our text, every branch that bears fruit, the Father prunes for the sole purpose that it might bear more fruit.
We see the father's tender care looking after the vineyard. And the careful action. I'm telling you this to make you more comfortable with God pruning in your life. It doesn't necessarily just mean removing you from a congregation, but it, things in your life that might be hindering God, God wants to remove for your good, for my good. What, what are the reasons in the last four or five years? Now, I say this carefully because I don't want to put things in your mind that's not there, but I don't really watch TV anymore. Denise hardly ever watches it. We do have a TV. Because many years ago, it used to distract us from doing what we wanted to do. It's so easy to sit in front of the telly all night, isn't it? Come on. Yeah, I meant that. I was speaking with Ken earlier, we were talking about seasons of life. I've done that series many years ago. We go through seasons in our life, don't we? Just like we go through seasons in our nation we have winter we have spring we have summer we have autumn and sometimes that happens in our walk with god sometimes we find ourselves in the in the autumn time of our life sometimes within the summer our elderly son peter at the moment has just gone to spain for a week and he's sending us videos and pictures and you know dad we're in a we're in a, we're in a heat wave and we're in southport yesterday <laughs> I said, hey, what a contrast, eh? A few hours on the plane makes. Well, sometimes that's our experience. We can be going through the storms of life when somebody else is on the, the mountaintop. And we have to often think, what have I done to, what, why is this happening to me? They're up there and they've got the sunshine. I, I found an amazing thing was when we went to Tenerife, Ken's experiences, and we got the, 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 the day tour up the, up the volca volcano, and it goes that high. You know what the amazing thing was? We drove through the clouds, and it was above the clouds, looking down. I said, it's like being on a plane. You look out the window, and all you see is the clouds. There was no... I thought that was amazing. So let's not fall off here, Lord. <laughs> See, God often prunes us, doesn't he? Takes us through those seasons of life. And why am I saying that? Hold on. Hold on. The rain will stop. The sun will come out. And we'll begin to sing the sun. That's took his hat off. Hip, hip, hip. See, last week he was in the storm. It didn't seem so nice. But we've got to learn as believers that the father, the husbandman, the gardener comes in and he purges our lives. Even removing things we consider desirable. And the reason he does that is so good. he wants us to produce more. He said that I want to produce fruit, but I want that fruit to remain. And listen, the purging that the husband man does, the father does, is like I said, it's not almost because it's sin in our life. Or that we're rebellious. But just the very fact that it's hindering us from bearing much fruit. As pastors, we welcome anybody into the congregation. We welcome, we would love to see people into the kingdom of God. But through experience and your experience, we look back and think, you know, that was, God dealt with that at that time, whether it's in me or in them. God wants to purify the vine. Jesus said, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. 
He said to the disciples, you've been clean because of my words. They heard the word and they believed the word. They believed he was the Christ. And in that salvation experience, they'd been attached to the vine. We were grafted in. And this process hasn't changed and it never will. We've got to be pruned. We've got to be attached to the vine. We've got to start producing fruit. Those of you that do gardening or plants or vegetation, you'll know. Some of, you know, when Ken and Denise and others get involved in the garden project here, we find out, you know, some of them, some of the things they planted, they have to have, do they call it edging? Not the ed dead heads off. They have to go, why are you taking the dead heads off? Because it's hindering growth. It's hindering vegetation. And it's simply the pruning it. We must abide in Christ, friends. Because he's the sole means of our salvation. Listen to what Paul declared in Ephesians 2, 8. He said that you and I are saved by grace through faith. It's not of our works. The sin should boast. That's why the scripture says, humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. If you think it's your guitar playing or your preaching or your teaching as is the gift, God has a way of humbling us. Amen. And when you're ready, he'll lift you up. Come on now. He also declares in Romans 10, 17, Paul says um, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, time to move away. See, hearing and receiving the gospel this morning, folks, is essential for salvation and you and I being attached to the vine. See, it's sad to say, this is why we talk about dead religion. Dead religion is, is, is all the outward appearance of religious stuff, Christianity I'm talking about. Well, Jesus had to come along to the Jews and he's there and says, you know, you might have religion, but you're like an open, a whitewashed sepulchre. It looks clean and nice on the outside, but inside that sepulchre, that grave, is full of dead man's bones. And often that's what we find that many have been falsely attached to. We need to understand that Jesus said that he's the vine, we're the branches. We cannot exist without him. Abide in me, and I in you. You shall bear much fruit. <coughs> he's not talking about our ability through our works to establish salvation. But he's talking about one Hindu fellowship, abiding in him. As our only hope to endure adversity that you and I face while bearing fruit for the Lord. We have to abide in Him. Now listen, abiding in Christ is not just coming to church. It's a different abiding in Him. He's talking about having a relationship with Christ. A daily one. You see that in verse 4, as you do, abiding me and I in you, the branch cannot bear fruit on its own. See, that's what he's telling us. The branches don't bear fruit because they're branches. The branches bear fruit because they're attached to the vine. Hallelujah. And Jesus clearly said in verse 4, he said, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me, Jesus said. I heard a 
message this week on faithfulness. He says that man or woman must be found faithful. You know what faithful means? Full of faith. Faithfulness. First to God, first to Christ, and then the, the effects of that faithfulness will outlive into our kingdom life. It determines what we do, what we're committed to. See, we've not got to forget the position that we're in, that we've rehearsed. He is the vine, can I hear an amen? We are the branches. He is the source of life. And we are the servant. Could have said amen, eh? Amen. amen. We're the servant of Christ. Amen. And finally, the limitation. The limitation. Verse 5. Jesus says, For without me you can do nothing. Nothing happening in your life? Spiritually dead in your relationship? Well, check yourself. Are you allowing the life of the vine to come through the branch? You and me? Because your knowledge and your gifting, I've learned, will only last you so long. You can ride on it for so long. But there's going to become a limit to your knowledge and to your experience and to your gifting. Unless you're attached to the vine. As the Bible says, we've got nothing to boast in ourselves. We used to sing that, didn't we? I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in Him. Paul said, I'm, I'm, I don't want to know nothing amongst you, save him and his crucifixion. See, Christ alone you know, is worthy of our praise, can I say? Can I hear an amen? Amen. He is the vine, we're the branches. Yeah, we sometimes get under the understanding that we're the, big, the bee's knees. It's happening because of us. But Jesus said, unless you abide in me, unless you've got life in me, you're not going to produce anything. Sometimes on branches, listen, sometimes the branches still have life in them. But it wasn't producing very good fruit. And the husband man, the good husband man, the vine dresser, will come along and think, and the next minute, you know, the next harvest, it's blossoming. See, think, I've got all the time. Think this morning. You're not being punished. You might be being pruned. Ask yourself, Father, why am I being pruned? What's happening in my life? Why am I, you know, what am I not doing that I should be doing? That I'm not producing the fruit of salvation. Are you fellowshipping with Jesus? Are you reading your word? Are you praying? Are you doing those things that is the life of the branch from the vine? Jesus said, I am the true vine. Don't be fooled by any others. All others are fake. <coughs> Amen? Amen. I am the vine. You and I are the branches. And he said, what the important for the branches is abiding in the vine. Being attached to it. Receiving the life flow from the vine. You can only produce fruit from the vine, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. As we close today, go away and think about it. Think about it, where you're at today. What are you not doing that you used to do? Where's your commitment that you used to have? As things dried up. Because we do, we go through seasons in our life, all of us. There'll be times we don't want to praise God. There'll be times we don't want to give. There'll be times we don't want to pray. But that's the time we have to say, why is this happening? Just think of it as that plant on your windowsill. And if it's not fed and watered, it's going to dry up. And what once was given a, a beautiful bloom is now shriveled and dying. Is that that picture of us? God willing, it's not. I'm not here condemning anyone, but I'm showing you that Father God He's watching over us. He's protecting us. And he's directing us.
Don't fight against it. Allow God to direct your life. Amen? Amen. Let's give Jesus a big hand. Hallelujah.